Welcome to episode two of the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview athletes who have done something something in particular that's that's interesting, that's noteworthy, that's something that inspires us to be better athletes and helps us get faster. And this time we're interviewing an athlete, Sergio Sandoval. And Sergio, you actually live from right here in Reno, Nevada, with where Trainer Road is, correct? Yeah, I live about 30 minutes away from where you guys are pretty sweet. So local yeah. athlete here, but we're interviewing you because you raced Leadville last year and mm-hmm. you did a full on prep for it. And you changed very much like, you know, the, the, the athlete you were, and you had like a transformational performance the whole way through. So we're going to look into that. Uh, first things first, if you want to know more about this episode, you can head to the trainer road forum and you can see links and everything else will link to uh, Sergio's ride on trainer road. So you'll be able to see that and you'll be able to see what we're talking about as we go through this. We'll have pictures there and Sergio's on the forum as well. So if you want to ask any questions or anything else, Sergio's happy to answer them for you, but we're going to break down your Leadville prep. So when did you start structured training? What year? Um, probably 2000 and. 16 when we moved to reno i kind of really stopped crappy mile rides here and there (laughs) um and focused on indoors got it and that's so that's when you started the structure what fast forwarding a bit what brought you to the point where you wanted to do leadville well i've always wanted to do leadville um as a kid i remember hearing the stories about the race you know growing up in the vale valley and uh hearing some some just stories about it and Mm -hmm. then just in the last couple of years, it sparked again. I was like, oh, hearing you guys talk about it, I was like, oh, yeah, totally, I remember this race. I've always wanted to do it, and uh, it just, I put my name in the hat, and it got pulled, so. Heck, yeah. And it was go time. Awesome. Uh, so let's step back now. Your family and career, so what do you do for your career, and, and what's your family situation like to give people more context around how you fit in training to your life? So I work your typical nine to five job, mm-hmm. um, sit at a desk, I work in marketing. Mm-hmm. I'm a designer for a small local marketing company in Reno. Awesome. And then, and then uh, um, what's your family situation like? So my wife trains, um, or we all try to stay fit, you know, and uh, we have two dogs that keep us busy <laughs> and we travel. Got it. So, yeah. yeah. So you have the free time to be able to, you know, when you come home from work, you're able to get in training or before work, you're able to get in training, that sort of thing. What's your training schedule like? Uh, When do you train throughout the week and how do you fit that in around your life? I do the, I have a mid volume plan. plan, So I work, I, my, my two days off are are Monday and um, Friday. So I usually get on the bike around five 30 or six just before I get ready for the day. First Mm -hmm. thing I do. So even how do you feel those early morning workouts? I don't, um, to be honest, um, I did this whole Leadville training fasted, Impressive. um, man. near the end, I needed to get a little, little couple goo gels here and there on me. But, um, from at the very beginning, it was all coffee, Wow. coffee and water. So what drove you to do that? Did you want to shift body composition or was it out of convenience for not having to get up earlier to eat or something like that? Uh, yeah, convenience at first, um, and then my wife started reading this fasting book and uh, I was really doing that. So I was like, Oh, I might as well just add this in. Um, you know, I gradually built it up to a 16 hour fast and, um, it was working for me. Composition was changing. Mm-hmm. Um, I started when I first started my training for Leadville, I weighed 221 pounds. And, uh, at the end I was at 191. Wow. That's a huge loss. Way to go. That's impressive. You mentioned that once you got into the harder stuff, like what, or once your training progressed toward the end, and I assume it was getting harder as it does progress, that's when you needed to start to add in carbohydrates strategically with it. Yeah. So I, I just, I wanted to keep going with the fasting because discipline just built and it was like, you know, I need, I need to wait 10 more minutes, Mm -hmm. you know? So, so the night before I just ended up eating more sweet potatoes or more, more healthy carbs. So we'll get into this later because on your mountain bike, you didn't have a power meter, uh, racing Leadville, but training indoors, obviously you had power. You're on a smart trainer, correct? Yes. Um, which one I do you have? Hummer, the hammer H2. Okay, cool. So you're on an H2. How much of an FTP increase did you see going from the beginning to the end of your training process for Leadville? So I started at 260 and I ended, I finished 
in June. That was my last FTP test, um, or July. Uh, it was it ended at three hundred, so a forty watt gain. Jeez, man, that's a lot. Do you do you ever? I would totally think this because I've I've gone through and done the fasted work before and gotten to the point where I could get through the majority of my workouts with it. But I'm in a spot right now where I'm like, bring on all the carbs I can. And I'm really trying to get mm -hmm. big gains. Do you ever, do you look back and think like, man, if I would have been eating more and, and not fasting, I could have increased. Did you, do you think about that or, or have you tested that out? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> every single time I, I, every single time I did an FTP test, it was fasted as well okay. uh, because I trained fasted. So I want to make sure that that's all consistent. Um, I don't want to cheat myself, you know, or like have like a, a big boost in, in, mm. uh, in yeah, I guess like an ego boost, uh, be like, oh yeah, I can do this, you know, and then the next day it's like, I can't do it. Mm. So yes, I did have those thoughts. I, I've actually thought about testing with, with at a uh, non fasted state and uh, I never actually did it because I think I would see that gain and be like, oh, I should actually do this. And, uh, <laughs> it would just screw me up in the end. And a priority for you going into this race was to shift body composition, right? Like, yes, yeah. just, I mean, with Leadville, it makes sense. Long, mm -hmm. sustained climbs that really, you know, power to weight really matters on those yeah. sort of efforts. Did you, uh, now, since the race, and this is jumping beyond it a bit, have you changed your diet at all since the race? And have you seen any changes in, in your training or performance at all from that? Or have you stayed with um, it? So... So we, we still do try to eat a little bit healthy, mm -hmm. uh, whole, whole, whole foods, of course, but um, we do have a couple of cheat meals here and there, you know, but um, I, yeah, I, I still have my regimen of fasted workouts in the morning. Um, I do see that at, the, at my FTP now, I need to bring in more carbs to be able to keep up. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that, that it does get challenging as it goes, as your FTP raises. Okay, cool. So that gives us kind of like a background on that. Now, what sort of training progression did you follow in preparation for Leadville and, and how long did it take you? So when I first learned that I got my name called, I, um, I did some research and I, I stumbled upon one of you guys' blog posts, the, uh, uh, I forget the name, but it was how to train for Leadville and insights from a sub nine finisher. Yep. So I followed his plan, you know, it said to do mid volume, sweet spot, uh, then base or sustainable, sustained power build. Yep. And then the, the marathon. Awesome. Yeah. Cross country so marathon. I did that. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with the base side of things and, and how you, you kind of like, uh, actually first kind of stepping back, what was your goal with Leadville? Was your goal just to finish or did you have a time goal that you wanted to do? I wanted to finish sub nine. That was my goal. Get that buckle. I wanted the big right? buckle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, did you think that that was possible coming into it or did it seem like a far off goal or did you feel like you just had to hit your marks and you'd get it? Um, it, it seemed a little bit impossible for not impossible, but just harder to get, um, you know, reading people saying, Oh, you need to be a four watt per kilo guy to, to get this. And you need to be super skinny and you need to have a power meter. <laughs> you need to do all this stuff and you have an s works bike and you know all this stuff that goes yeah. along with it and so i my wife made this crazy spreadsheet that said what that gave me my ftp my ftp at sea level versus at elevation and then from what elevation what percentage dry lost in vo2 mm -hmm. and so i just kind of followed that and i was like okay i had my own marks that said okay if i can do it at 3.5 watts per kilo then i will get this time and and i just yeah that's just what i did awesome so you just knew that like if you trained and hit your marks you'd tick mm -hmm. it off but you probably was it more so looking at the smaller more achievable goals rather than looking at the overwhelming goal of sub nine i assume that yeah. was the focus yeah yeah the more the more weight i lost too the easier that goal seemed to be you know mm -hmm. so uh you went through base and you went through build and you went through specialty and the build was sustained build specialty was cross country marathon, which was the hardest one that you went through? Like what was the hardest point in your training? Um, I think it was cross country marathon mm -hmm. because at that point I was getting to a point where I needed to take in more carbs and I didn't really understand that at first. At first I thought I was just like overreaching and doing too much. Um, 
and maybe maybe I saw that I was losing weight, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I can I can indulge a little bit more. I can, you know, just kind of got, got into that little slippery slope, if mm. you will. But uh, the second I noticed I needed to bring in more carbs and bring in for the work, then that kind of fixed itself. Um, okay, so let's get into some of the stuff like uh, when on coming up to the event, like the pre-event stuff. Did you do any sort of shakedowns beforehand? And did you do long rides, like uh, add those into your plan? How did you start to work your way up in specificity for Leadville? So all my training rides were done inside. Okay. Um, I did have a couple... Uh, races local races that i did mm -hmm. but the rest is all done inside um i did have a north star pass and nice. i could only go as long as i did my intervals first that was my <laughs> nice that was my goal and so i worked that in to, to get some skills in but leading up to the race a couple weeks before i did a ride up Vail mountain and a couple pre-rides in leadville um mm. Did Leadville feel like a shock once you went there? Uh, did you notice any difference just in ease of breathing or, or any sort of, you know, increase in RPE with those four days the, that you were there beforehand? The first couple of days that we were in Colorado, we did do a pre-ride. Um, I did a sugar loaf. Yeah. Uh-huh. The first one. And um, I did feel that I was like, oh man, there's no way I could do this. I like race <laughs> pace. Um, you know, and, but then the race came and it was fine. What was your pacing plan coming in? How did you plan on attacking the race? It's so long and so varied. Yeah, so I didn't have a power meter. Um, I didn't do any negative splitting. I said I need to average 12 miles an hour or higher. Got it. So did and, you fight for 12 miles an hour everywhere? Or were you just looking at like your... Because that would be your super tricky, like, you know, if we're talking about Columbine. How would you manage that? Like no, as just, far as uh, the, the average speed? In that case, in yeah, that so case. I guess once once I got to Columbine, I was like, okay, I just need to make sure I get there at the four and a half or three and a half. I forget what what the time is to come mm. back. Mm -hmm. And I think I got there like four thirty one, I want to say, and then I turned around. But uh, yeah, I just mainly focused on the, having a higher twelve miles an hour. Got average. it. So you were looking at the overall average, not the any time when you were riding. You didn't look at making that exact moment 12, but you were just looking at overall. Like, I just want to yeah, make overall. sure I know yeah. that I need 12 to meet my goal, right? Yeah. To, uh, the elapsed time. Yeah. Not the riding time. Yeah. Which is important. Unfortunately, they can't cut out yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. It'd be amazing if they could, right? But yeah, it doesn't really work yeah. that way. What was your nutrition yeah. like that week? Uh, did you shift it to be more carb centric that week or did you wait? for that um yeah so we for for the week leading up to the race mm -hmm. yeah yes so the, the three days before i started doing carbo loading um which i implemented rice i that was the first implementation i made and then chicken sweet potatoes you know all that stuff mm -hmm. um and then i also started to eating cereal just That's the, Nate, of cereal. <laughs> the Nate carb load tactic. <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I think I was on an 850 grams of carbs Ooh, for the wow. day. That's impressive. So I was eating a regular meal that would usually make like overload a plate with a bowl of cereal or two. Oh, every one of them. And then some gummies after. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to pack it in in any way you can, yeah. right? Was mm -hmm. it hard yeah. to do that? Yeah, uh, it was it was it was really hard actually to be honest because I would eat my meals and then we would go walk around or we'd just hang out and my wife would come back with like uh, fruit shake or or gummies that I need to eat. Um, yeah, it was just it was an eating fest for the first three for the last three days. Yeah, it's it's it had to have been hard after being like so disciplined with your diet and everything else than going into that mm -hmm. and feeling like it was just it feels like gluttony, right? Mm -hmm. But it's. It's what you got to do. Um, yeah. Did you, and bef we won't get into like exact uh, specifics as we'll get into this now, but did you feel that that was successful or did that play a key role in your, in your sub nine time at Leadville? I, oh yeah, I think it did because um, a couple months before I did the Tahoe Trail 100 and I did not follow my eating mm. plan and, and that just, that I, I paid the dues for that, you know, and um and so I told myself, I will not repeat Tile Trail 100 again, <laughs> and I will eat everything that I can and I need to. 
So uh, what was your time at Tahoe Trail 100 for a point of reference for people? I think it was 521. So did you improve? The green. Okay, I was just going to say that. Green Corral is what you got then? Yeah, yeah. Got it. So, um, and we'll get into the corral stuff really soon here. So, uh, did you learn anything else from Tahoe Trail 100 that you ended up change or that ended up changing your strategy for Leadville, other yeah. than nutrition? Yeah. Um, other than nutrition, you said. Yeah, yeah. Or the specifics that you learned from nutrition too. That works too. I, I just learned I needed to eat. You know, I, <laughs> I learned that you shouldn't put scratch in in your use in your use wee bag because. <laughs> the sediment kind of clogs up the hose and you can't really drink. It makes it harder. Yeah. So I ended up switching to Merton, which mm-hmm. has made a huge difference. What was your logistic or your like logistical plan? Who was going to be helping you and where were they going to be and what were they going to have? Yeah. So my wife, my mother-in-law and a couple of other of our friends were there and they were going to meet me at the Twin Lakes, take out my trash, put new stuff in, we changed my pack, give me a new pack, clean my sunglasses. At the beginning of the race, I had uh, this like creaking sound when oh. my cleat touched the pedal. Oh man. So, so I had my, my, my step uncle in law, I, I don't know what you want to call him. <laughs> he just put lube on there and uh, that, that made a huge difference. I, I, I personally felt better after being, Oh, it's like the, that. it's like a form of like in interrogation, the people that do interrogation, all they need to do is subject you to a squeaky cleat. Like they don't, they don't, <laughs> they don't, they'll get all the information they need. It's so bad. Yeah. Right? yeah. It was so bad, man. But, um, <laughs> so that was, uh, arriving to Twin Lakes and then coming back down again, I stopped at Twin Lakes mm-hmm. and same thing, change, um, change bottles, different goose, um, new packs. Um, I had him put lube all over the tire, all over the chain again. Um, and then, yeah, then just kept going. And then the next time I, the next time I would see them was a pipeline. Okay. At the base of pipeline. Yeah. In a pipeline, it was a little tricky cause they, I might've not seen them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a chance I couldn't run into them. So they, so I left and I had an extra Meriton uh, bottle without water. Just in the, as an emergency, if I needed to stop at the ice station and get water and then refill and go, but I was lucky enough to see them and I was happy to see them. And that, that stretch was rough. <laughs> yeah. Um, what what bike were you on? I was on a Santa, 2016 Santa Cruz Tallboy CC. Okay. And what? So what travel do you have front and rear to give people uh, an idea? Uh, I want to say one one twenty in the front and a hundred maybe in the back or. or yeah. 110 in the back. I think 110, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's somewhere like 110 to 120, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what tires were you running on the bike? You mentioned that you switched them. Yeah, so I had Maxxis Icons 2.2s. Got it. And then what did you change on the chain ring? Or what was your chain ring size? Because you know that you went to a 1050 with Eagle in the back. But what was your chain ring size up front? Up yeah, front, I had a 34. A 34. Okay. Yeah, cool. which I regret. I wish I was a little lower, maybe yeah. 32. I had a 32 and I wish I had a 30. So okay. uh, I, I, everything was fine until on going back up power line. And yeah, I wish that I had a 26. If anybody, <laughs> any, you ask anybody in that moment, right? And they'll wish that they had anything lower because it's so steep yeah. and you're just so yeah. completely tired. So, um, yeah. um, And then you got to the Green Corral did you feel yeah. like that was uh, beneficial from the basic lottery position or do you feel like it didn't make as much of a difference as you thought? I think it would have made a big difference. Um, yeah. One thing that happened to me was uh, we didn't want to, we, we took out the bike rack from the, the, the truck mm-hmm. because we, my, my wife wanted more space so she can back in and out if she needed to. Um, yeah. And so I ended up putting the bike, the bike took out the front wheel and put it in the back the morning of. Yeah. And I didn't realize that I should have done that. You know, it's, <laughs> that's like the number one thing you don't do. So yeah. I took it apart and then we get back to the starting line and I started putting it together. And then the, the, the front uh, bearing hub cap uh-huh. came off. Oh no. <laughs> so I was like, Oh no, did I break this? What's going on? So and I was able to fix it in the dark and uh, rode it around and there's no, no, no break rub and no, it was, it was Hope, fine. You're hoping your wheel didn't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we get to the 
start line and uh yeah i saw the people on the other side of the street yeah and that's that's when i was like oh man i'm glad i'm i'm here you know yeah because green corral is kind of like a cutoff if you cross the main street there and then you go up higher then it's a it's a whole different pack right yeah yeah. yeah. Let's go through your race, shall we? Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff to, to go through. So we already know your pacing plan, which you were just looking at, like, I just want to finish with a 12 mile an hour average speed. Um, so we already know that. And we already know um, what you had, you know, breakfast that morning, everything else. And then what was your nutrition plan throughout the day? Did you break it down to like, I want to eat this much per hour or this much overall? how did you break that down? So <clears throat> we did the math um, during one of my trainings in Reno, back in Reno, I did, uh, I tried to eat five goos in one hour to see if my body would take it <laughs> Yeah, and how it, how it handled for the rest of the day. How'd it go? <laughs> it was fine. You know, um, awesome. I went to work, to, I went to work after and no problems there. Um, just super hyped up on sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I did that. And, and so for Lenvo, my plan was to eat a hundred grams of carbs an hour. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then, so you planned out your Martin and goose and everything else to, to satisfy yeah. that basically. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I had my Garmin telling me every 10 minutes, take a sip of the use we pack. And then every, every 10 minutes or every 30 minutes, depending on the hour, I guess it would tell me to, to remember, remind me to eat a goo. Yeah. It's or funny whatever how- was in the back. It's funny how we forget that stuff, right? Or you just don't feel like it, but having something that alerts you, you're like, oh yeah, okay, I need to be obedient to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes a huge difference. Uh, okay, mm-hmm. so let's look at it first. Uh, first things first, on the start, I found that the start was way crazier than I thought it was going to be in terms of like, uh, people were like really fighting for position. Did you notice that as well mm-hmm. in the Green yeah. Corral? Yeah, yep, and especially at that first turn. That's and crazy. going up sugar loaf, it's like, you know, you'll be, you'll get up there eventually. Just, you know, hammer on the flats and take your time on the uphill. Um, but yeah, everyone was fighting for position. You hear people screaming, yelling at each other. Yeah. <laughs> Brake squealing. You had looking at it right now. So on the start section, basically to the bottom of St. Kevin's, which is the first climb, you average 21.7 miles an hour. So granted it's downhill, but still that's fast. Like, Like, so that lets you know, it's not like a neutral, easy rollout. Like this thing Mm -hmm. goes fast, like very quickly from the gun. And it's, you really have to be heads up. It took you 17 minutes to get to the start of St. Kevin's. You averaged 142 beats per minute for that first section there. And then when you got to St. Kevin's, which is the first significant climb that took you 30 minutes and 29 seconds, you averaged seven and a half miles an hour up that. And your heart rate was 161 on that one. Were you going really hard on that climb? Did you try to settle in? How did that climb go? At the beginning, it was, I started to settle in, but then I kept uh, seeing holes or you know more space from people, so I kept trying to get those. Um, and I pre-wrote that first section so I knew where the top was. Mm-hmm. So I knew that once I get to the top, I can rest and, and coast. Yeah, and that yeah. did you get tacks in your tires at the top? No, you didn't. Oh, you lucked out, no. man. Uh, yeah. After that, you have a road descent. Then you go into Sugarloaf, which is like a gorgeous climb, but it's really like it's got a lot of big rock on it, and it's kind of like mm-hmm. rocky and chunky. On that one, you did it in thirty-one minutes and twenty-nine seconds, so almost the same time as Sugarloaf uh, to give people an idea, or sorry, St. Kevin's to give people an idea. Uh, and you average nine miles an hour on this one. It's a lot less steep uh, than mm-hmm. St. Kevin's. And, but your heart rate was dried around the same of 158 beats per minute. Was there any learnings or what was your strategy on that climb? Um, I didn't really have a strategy. I just, uh, I, I knew that I, I didn't want to be left behind. Mm. So I kind of just followed this pack. Why, uh, why was that? Through. Why were you concerned about being left behind on that one? Because I knew that uh, coming down, there was going to be power line. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there's some road section. Yeah. So I was playing the long game of just stick, sticking with this group so I can keep moving forward. Got with it. Them. Uh, and the descent, it's funny. Like when you look at the descent, your heart rate didn't drop that much on the descent <laughs> from where really? it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Your heart rate dropped down to 150. So I mean, not, not a huge amount. What's, what's a thresh or what's your max HR to give people kind of an idea? The max that I've seen uh-huh. um, at sea level was 196. Okay. Uh, the max I've seen at Reno is 188, 189. Got it. 
So that's uh, that gives people an idea. You were sitting, you know, below your threshold in terms of heart rate, at least uh, for sure. Yeah. So. Uh, and then, so you went down the descent super fast, took you 11 minutes, and then you got to the, we'll just call pipeline that whole section. Cause you come down there, you've got a road section, the long pipeline road, and then you yeah. end up getting to twin lakes eventually, uh, from that. So <clears throat> with that section, that's, I found that that was one where I, I realized I wasn't following my plan. I was riding too hard and trying to stick with groups. Did you find that? Did you try to stick with groups? Cause that's a big section where everybody says you have to find a group and stick with it in that section. What did you do? So when we got down at the beginning of it, I, I was following me, I was somewhat close to this single speed uh, girl and her husband, I assume, or, or somebody coach maybe yelled, get to that group, get, get to that group. So I was like, oh, okay. So there's a group right there. So I took that chance and uh, I think she tagged along with me cause I'm, 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 I'm pretty big dude. Mm -hmm. Broad shoulders yeah. And all. Good draft. <laughs> yeah. So I think she came along and, and we ended up catching that group and, um, and yeah, then we're just hauling all the way to twin lakes or to the single track section. So in that section there, like if you average it, I mean, it's 52 minutes and 30 seconds. So it's a, it's a long section, but you were carrying like some high speed to give people an idea on the power line descent. If you were averaging just under 18, and with pipeline, you were this long flat section, you were just over 16. So that's, that's pretty fast. Like it's not a huge difference even from the descent. Did you feel like you went too hard or do you feel like you paced it? Well, I, I, I paced it well. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't feel like I went too hard or anything. Yeah. It was good. Good. Uh, and you didn't stop at that aid station that you can do a pipeline. Then you just went right through that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, then I realized, oh man, I'm going pretty, my, my average, I think then was like 16, 15 overall, like elapsed. And, uh, I just realized, wow, I'm, I'm going pretty fast. <laughs> this is, um, according to the plan that we had, I was too, I was ahead of my time. Right. Did you, were you worried that, that you were felt like you were going too fast or? Yeah. Yeah. At first I was like, oh, well I feel pretty good. I'm going fast. I'm ahead of the time that I was my estimated time, but, uh, I feel good. So just keep on going. Yeah. Why did you choose to skip that aid station and do twin lakes instead? I thought it was too soon of an aid station. So yeah, that, that, I think that was the main reason it was too soon. Yeah. I, I think at that point it was two hours in or less. Mm -hmm. So after that, uh, you have that the single track section basically where you end up, you know, after you get to, you got to your aid station at twin lakes, um, you checked in and then from there you just have a, a pretty short jaunt over to the bottom of Columbine. Um, yeah. is there anything you want to share there or should we just jump straight into Columbine? Um, if you, yeah, if you, if you stop at uh twin lakes, don't get pretzels and get going cause <laughs> your mouth just dries up. And it just becomes powder. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah pretzels but yeah. they were probably salty and felt like what you needed right because of all the sugar yeah yeah, yeah. and then I, I ate some and just spit them out because I, I couldn't breathe and it was drying out my mouth and <laughs> yeah. i had a person offer me beef jerky uh in that aid station and i was like like i know savory but no way like i would oh <laughs> man that would be really bad for my gut so i skipped yeah uh, yeah. And then I assume you skipped also the Twin Lakes alternate aid station, which is right at the base of Columbine. It's before you make the turn and start climbing. You skipped that one mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So what was your plan for pacing up Columbine? Because looking at it, uh, you did a pretty darn good job. You climbed it in an hour and 31 minutes and you averaged 4.8 miles an hour. That includes a stop in there, which it looks like you took a break when it changed to the Jeep trail uh, for just a bit um, for one reason or another which we'll get to in just a sec. And then also like your heart rate, it's hard to see a really high heart rate usually because you're at that point, you're basically almost at 13,000 feet. It's yeah. really, really high. So your heart rate just doesn't go that high. It's just kind of like kind of maxed out in a way uh, really low. Uh, but on that climb, you're at 152 beats per minute. So already like those ones, those times of looking at 160 heart rate is already gone. Like we're not seeing it. What was your pacing strategy on Columbine? Did you go hard or were you trying to just stay within yourself? I just, yeah, I was just staying within myself. Um, once I got to that Jeep trail, I did get off the bike and walk. I think those are the times you're seeing where I took a break. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kept walking, but I, I do remember seeing people pedaling up it or like 
they see a small little flat section where they can bike and they get on the bike and, mm-hmm. and, and ride it and then stop. And I just, you know, I thought about doing that, but then just the effort wasn't there. It didn't seem the right, the right time to do yeah. it at. Yeah. Especially if, you know, if you do get on there and make some sort of mistake and go too hard, then it's really tough to recover. Yeah. Okay. It just seemed very inefficient to get off, get on, get off, get on when you can just walk and keep it steady. So how long of uh, how long were you walking? Do you think roughly in terms of time? I would probably say fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Um, I walked quite a bit. Yeah, I think when you when I saw you pass pass me the other way, I I think I I, I was still walking. Got it. So you yeah. were um, and and to to clarify too for people that don't know, you're walking because you're just stuck in a line of riders that are doing the same thing you can't really ride right it's everybody's walking more or less no at that point it was just me and a couple other people okay that were you know there was no like congo line there was nothing right nothing like that <laughs> um it was just too steep and that's where i wish i had a uh a 32 or 30 yeah yeah it gets it gets really steep there i think the steepest part of the day is pipeline but that's that section where it turns to the jeep trail it goes from the smooth fire road to a jeep trail is steep for sure. Yeah. Did you stop at the top of Columbine? That's a common spot I see people stopping. Um, so midway through the Jeep section, I needed to to, to go number one. So yeah. that's all I did. I yeah. did the loop, used the restroom, and then left. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to wait around because, you know, you don't want to be hanging up at 13,000 people. <laughs> I know, right? Many people. Yeah. As soon as I saw that up there, I was just like, turn around, get get back yeah. down this thing. On the descent, looking at it, it took you 23 minutes to descend it, and you averaged 19 miles an hour, which is pretty darn fast. Was it, uh, how'd you manage the traffic? Because that was a scary thing for me, at least, descending with all the traffic. Um, it was fine. You know, there's a couple hairy points here and there, but... Um, I got behind this 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 guy going down, and I think he kind of slowed me down, um, which is fine because it gets pretty hairy, you know, as you know. Yeah. Um, but once I found the, a chance to pass him, I just I, I went for it, and um, and yeah, just got ahead of him. Nice. And to, for more information, what's it like? I guess we're we're talking about it being hairy. Why is it why is it complex descending that section? So it's kind of the jeep. It's a literally a jeep trail. So Think of it as like a the width of a jeep can yeah. go on there. So if you have two big handlebars, that's literally the width of the jeep. Yeah. So, and on the other side is a cliff, yeah. or you know, like it's, it's a bench cut jeep trail. Yeah. So there's people coming. People are trying to pass each other going up because they're either riding or they're running with their bike. Um, and if you're behind somebody who's not as confident riding down, then that kind of makes things a little more challenging, also. And sometimes, you know, if you're going pretty fast and you come to a halt, there's rocks coming. Yeah. And you hit yeah. the brakes. At least in my case, there was. And um, yeah, yeah, that's why. Two way traffic in, on the Jeep trail yeah, at 13,000 feet when everybody's pretty shelled already is it's a, it's a it's a bad cocktail for sure. Um, yeah. So once you got down from there, you passed through the Twin Lakes aid station or passed the Twin Lakes alternate aid station and got to Twin Lakes. Uh, you are past mm-hmm. halfway at this point. Do you remember what your speed was at that point and what your outlook was? Like, what? That's a good check-in point for like how the rest of the race is going to go. Where were you at, and what did you have to do after that? Um, I think at that point I was at like eleven something miles an hour average, and I, I kind of got like a little down on myself, but not not really because I knew there was some more road coming. Mm-hmm. Um, And when we get down to Twin Lakes, my wife was still there and she was like, okay, you need, you're behind, Mm -hmm. you're behind, you need to get going. So the, our stops were probably like 15 to 20 seconds long. Yeah. And, uh, she was more worried than I was. I want to kind of hang around (laughs) and talk for a little bit because I wanted a little break, but she just, you know, pushed me to get going. Um, that's cool. And so I went, um, then on that road section, I ended up running into this guy. His name is Mark. I forget his last name, but he's done it like eight times or something. Oh, cool. And he was telling me, um, if you if you keep up this pace that you're up right now, you'll definitely go under nine. And so that gave me more motivation to keep going and keep doing what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
on that last section, kind of going back on the long pipeline section, it took you an hour and 10 minutes and 59 seconds. So uh, looking at it going the other way, it took you 52 minutes, an hour and 10 going back. There is a bit a bit more climbing going back um, uh, for sure. But then did you also, were you dealing with wind in that section? I know I was at least. It was kind of a headwind for a while. Yeah, and I was alone too. Oh. Um, yeah, and, and I think then I was averaging – like through my speed, not averaging, but my, my, my real speed was like 17 mm-hmm. and uh, coming down the other, the opposite way at the beginning, it was like 20, 30 or something was where I was in the group. And yeah. And I think that also was like, Oh, you know, I need to get going. And yeah. I was feeling a little frustrated too, but was your nutrition going to plan at this point? Did you have to make any changes there or was it still yeah, everything was it, on course? Everything was on course. I, I do wish I had a little bit more maybe during that time, but yeah, everything was done as we said on paper. Yeah. Good. Uh, now climbing back up uh, power line, which is for my money, it's the hardest climb I've ever done. Um, just for, you know, it's probably, it would be hard on its own, but definitely where it falls in that race, it makes it even, even harder. Uh, looking at power line, it took you 40 minutes on that climb, uh, average 4.8 miles an hour. So the exact same speed that you average going up Columbine, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and then once again, though, your heart rate's kind of like capped because at this point you still only hit 152 for an average going up, um, where you try, I assume you were still trying really hard. I was just trying hard to not fall over. Um, how did you approach that climb? Did you have to walk it, uh, sections of that too? Yeah. I walked sections of that for sure. Um, just, uh, it was getting a little warm, but mm-hmm. not, not too warm. Um, the, so the, the false flats were kind of getting to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. there was a guy playing, uh, I'm sorry if you if you like bagpipes, but this guy was playing bagpipes and it was not it, it, it pretty sound. Um, That's awesome. So, so yeah, I mean, it was hard. I walked probably a good majority of that. Um, people were there, you know, handing out pizza or or water, and I'm grateful for it. And I take some of the water, um, pour it on my back, yeah, kind of cool off, and just just keep going. I knew that uh, after once you get to the top, it's downhill. Yep. So that, that was my main priority is get to the downhill. Yeah. You descend sugar loaf. It's rocky. Uh, everything go okay on the descent there. Yeah. Yeah. It was fine. And then you have turquoise lake road climb where you climb back out there on the road. Did you find people to ride with at this point or were you still solo? And how did you pace that climb? I was solo. Um, but we, we were somewhat of a group, two or three people, if you call out a group. Um, but we weren't like riding together. We just kind of either, they passed me, I passed them, you know. Yeah. Um, I started standing a lot of the time, climbing there. Um, I usually don't do that. Um, why'd, you, why'd you start doing that? Just because I, I needed to kind of get my mind off. <laughs> just do something different than sitting. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Was your back tightening up at all? Was that a motive or like leg muscles getting fatigued? Yeah, leg muscles getting fatigued. Just trying and trying to work other muscles other than the, the, the main ones I've been using. Yeah. 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 yeah it gets, and it, you know, you don't really notice how long that climb is because you're <laughs> flying down it at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, it's like three miles or something. Yeah. So. It feels really long. Uh, it's yeah. very, very long for sure. Yeah. So the final yeah. section, it's interesting. So the, the final section is once you descend St. Kevin's, I guess, you know, the St. Kevin's mm-hmm. climb and then, I didn't realize how long it was going to be to the finish and how like circuitous and non straightforward the route would be on mm-hmm. getting back up to the, the start finish line. Yeah. Uh, that met for me was really mentally hard because I was like, Oh man, we aren't turning the way I thought we were going to turn. And like, I feel like we're going further away. And then that yeah. really long drag where you're taking that dirt road coming back in your heart rate didn't change much. Like you're still 151. Uh, so like in terms of average, and it didn't change much at all. And that's common to see kind of at the end of the day, like your heart, your whole body is pretty fatigued. So your heart rate's not going to be, be excited and just suddenly jump up to 190 or something. Um, how did, did you ride with other people? Were you really gunning it toward the end? Uh, were you still trying to take in nutrition? What did the last section go like for you? Again, I kept running into this guy, Mark, because we he would pass me, I'd pass him. And 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 he, was, he would just tell me, okay, yeah, if we keep this up, we'll hit it. We'll get sub nine, we'll get sub nine. And, and then we get to the road section and it's, you know, crosswind or no, no head, headwind. And, um, and so I just, I just got tucked in <laughs> and just hammered it out. And, um, till we got to that dirt, long dirt section. 
but uh yeah i was definitely hammering it because i wanted to be done and i wanted to go under nine did you have arrow bars you just made the arrow position if you're watching this on youtube you'd see that no i no. just yeah i just, just i just yeah, got I just small it, yeah yeah i grabbed yeah. the bars um yeah. so you came across and do you remember your official time yeah 840 no 848.33 awesome official time impressive uh super impressive time man uh, if anybody that yes. finishes Leadville period, it's an impressive feat that they should be proud of. How, mm -hmm. how did this rank in terms of hardness compared to the other things you've done? I mean, you've ridden across the United States of America. That's pretty big, but was this the hardest thing you've done or how did it yeah, rank? It was definitely one of the hardest things I've done. Yeah. Yeah. I would what, put it up there. What was the hardest part throughout the day? What section do you think of in your nightmares, so to speak, uh, looking back at Leadville? I think, uh, she was the steepest one the, the power line the power line yeah power yeah line. every time i see a power line or i hear that <laughs> sound I'm like, oh no <laughs> it's like ptsd <laughs> but, right <laughs> yeah it's like ptsd yeah. yeah yeah it's brutal that that climb is so hard man just mm -hmm. an absolutely yeah a bear of a climb what advice would you have giving to other people that are planning to do leadville it could be specific or it could be general but like Things that you would say to your friend if they said, "Oh, I'm going to do Leadville." Don't don't be scared to go out of your your comfort zone. Yeah, you know, even if that means putting work, you know, getting up earlier or 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 missing out on activities. Um, yeah. Yeah, because this was pretty far out for what you. I mean, you hadn't done events like this before. You know, like mm -hmm. like big ones like this. So this is a big. This is a big move for you, like a big change that required a lot of commitment. Get it, like you mentioned, getting up at five thirty and getting make sure you're training by then and changing your diet and changing your entire lifestyle. Yeah. It's a huge commitment. Yeah, missing friend events. You know, I, I stopped drinking for most of my training. Um, yeah, just a lot of uh, I had to give up a lot, but yeah. I earned what I wanted. So for sure, it's worth That's it, all right? Yeah, 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 worth it. Payoffs worth it for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sergio. This is cool. I, I hope that others can join in in the discussion. I know that Leadville, for, at least for the year 2020, if you're listening to it now, it's been canceled for the year because of the pandemic that we're dealing with. But moving forward, uh, hopefully it's an event that can happen in 2021 and onward. I know lots of folks are planning on it. So if you want to get into the weeds on, on what you exactly need to do to have the best time at Leadville, then you should jump into the forum post uh, for this Successful Athletes podcast. It's with Sergio Sandoval. And if you just look up episode two, Successful Athletes podcast, you'll find it. And we'll jump in there. Sergio, I'm sure you'll be in there too. Um, yeah. Chiming in and answering and and sharing anything that you learned. We can chat everything from equipment to nutrition to pacing, all that stuff. So uh, with that, thanks, Sergio. We appreciate you doing this, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, and thanks for making such a great product for everyone to use. Oh, man, yeah, our pleasure. Our pleasure, uh, for sure. So uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up and comment down below on what race you want to do, or if you want to do Leadville, uh, tell us what you would have done to get a faster time or what you have done to get a fast time or the things that you did to totally screw up like me. Um, and I had a really bad moment, which we'll talk about at some point uh, later on, I'm sure. But uh, join in and let us know in the comments down below. And we will talk to you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.